Hello everyone. Good morning. My name is Don. Um uh let me go to my uh slide, yeah. Give me a moment. Okay, hi. Um uh I have been in the food business uh commercially for about seven years. Uh cooking food, uh um being in the front of house serving people as well as uh consultancy with uh, a couple of friends uh, early on. Before that, uh, I baked at home for um, about four years uh, and selling to friends and all that. So that, that's part of uh, the later part of my life. Um, the earlier part, uh, I uh, worked with the government. I was in an investigation branch doing criminal investigation. Uh, I've also uh, traveled the world for about six to seven years uh, helping humanitarian work. Uh, so generally, uh, that's a uh, broad scope of the things that I've done. Um, so I entitled today's uh, um, um, talk, uh, Discovering Me. Uh, I'll tell you more later. Let's jump to the next slide. Okay, that's... Okay, let me remove myself. Am I blocking you guys? Okay, uh, the picture, the big picture is a uh, Chinese New Year picture uh, of my wife, my daughter and myself in the park. So we love plants, we love, uh, we just love plants, we like nature, uh, it makes us uh, sane. Uh, my son's not there because he ran away to Akong's house. Uh, the other picture is us uh, taken like maybe four years ago when we were all at home and I think we baked something together. So, so my son is there, the one on the extreme uh, right corner. His name is Jedediah. My wife's name is Suching. She's a wonderful uh, scientist turned baker. Uh, okay, next slide. Yeah, it is. Yeah, so the name of my shop is called uh, The Loaf Shack. Uh, my surname is Lo, L-O-W-E. I put the apostrophe F to make it sound like a loaf of bread because you can see, uh, because uh, all our concept is based on bread because everything we bake from scratch by hand. So these are two of the few sandwiches that we have. This one here is uh, the cheeseburger. The brioche bread is a very soft, uh, uh, fluffy bread. It's got lots of butter and eggs inside. So it makes it soft, uh, fluffy. The one on this side, this one here is uh, sourdough. Uh, the Crazy bread that everybody likes now because of the fermentation, it gives a sour tone. But this one's got three different cheeses in there uh, with caramelized onions and spices. So this is really yummy. Um, okay. Uh, all right. Yeah, so these are just some of the snapshots of people that have come to our place uh, and put us on okay, Instagram. So, um, we I, love animals, we love people. So with the are, very background of doing okay, so many things, I, I went I into the food business to... because uh, ever since I was a child, uh, right? Uh, uh, like uh, six, seven years old, I actually love cooking. So one day I just woke up in the morning and I think it was probably a weekend, no school. Uh, so I decided to just cook some uh, bean soup. So I went to the market, I bought noodles, the, yeah, the white noodles, and I bought uh, vegetables, chai sim, I think. I brought it home, I threw everything in the hot water, I boiled it, it tasted terrible. There were no no garlic, no sauces, no taste, nothing. It's just water and vegetable. So from that day onward, somehow I think I, I decided in my mind, in my heart that I'm going to try to make beautiful food. So whatever that my parents uh, who were working uh, had left in uh, they left in the cupboard in the in the kitchen kitchen cabinet, I'll just take out and cook. So I started experimenting with the famous baked beans, Heinz baked beans to be precise. So I'll cook Heinz baked beans with onions. I'll cook it with garlic. I cook it with hot dog. I cook it with uh, uh, cheese. I cook it with pepper. Everything I could find in the house, I put it in and I experimented. And only upon um. Hindsight later, I re I discovered that actually what I did was by doing all this cooking and doing all the tasting, I discovered that I create I created this thing called a food periodic table at the back of my mind. So whenever I look at food and I, I taste someone else's food, right, I, I'm thinking in my mind, hey, if we had added this element or that element, it would have tasted better this way. Or if we minus this particular thing, then it would have been a clearer dish. So it became a, a natural thing for me. Uh, I... Only when I grew a bit older, uh, like in late secondary school, O levels, right? And I was trying to think what to do in my life, uh, that I decided to join the military. Uh, I didn't go into food because one of the thoughts that in my mind was that if I worked in the kitchen, I gotta stand 12, 14 hours a day, and I don't want to stand. I want to sit down in an aircon room if possible, and just some movement, minimal movement if possible. So, so that's why I didn't go into that. But eventually, when I finished my stint with the military, uh, I was fortunate to be posted as a a uh, criminal investigator in a in a special branch. It's called a special investigation branch. And we did um 
whatever uh, uh, cases of people taking drugs or or, or 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 vandalism or theft or somebody using a gun to shoot somebody stuff like that all those uh what you see on CSI so we I did that for a while um then when I was done uh I joined an organization called Youth with a Mission and I traveled Asia for about six seven years India China Vietnam Cambodia uh, uh Thailand uh um KL KL is not a country, it's a capital, but it's different from the rest of Malaysia. So that's when I went to help out people, whatever I could, uh, whatever that was available. Uh, I helped in medical, whatever that, that was available. I just just went to do all these things. And I and I and I discovered that every year of my life, there's something about myself that I discovered that I never knew I I was, I liked, or I did not like. But it's when I took the step to go out and try doing it. And I discovered that, hey, okay, actually, I'm very good at this. or I, I, I'm i bad at it. So I begin to discover and I enjoy uh, discovering myself. Of course, there are also things about myself that I discovered like, oh man, I'm such a bad, uh, I have a bad attitude or, or, or I'm so bad at accounting and, and writing uh, notes and all that. But it's fine. It's fine, Pastor. I learned to uh, also accept myself. Uh, so that's that. Then the last thing that I've done uh, currently uh, till date is when um uh, I I I had a stirring in my heart to uh build something that's an answer to a question. Then I had to ask myself, what is the question that I want to answer? And the question was, um, what solution can I give to people that will make them uh, happy and to 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 take that solution from me and be willing to part money with it? In this case, to pay me for my my services. So that's when uh, I went into baking. I I, I thought to myself, what well, was something that I really loved to do when I was a little kid, right? And it was cooking. So in the end, I started making cookies. So I made cookies for a living uh, for a short period of time. I did not survive. It was a very hard market. It's different from today where you can go online. Those days, the government does not allow you to go online if you don't have a certified proper kitchen. So I baked from home. Um, but from there, uh, an opportunity arose where a cafe space was available and the people approached us and said, I think you and your wife are a good fit. So that's how we started in this business. Anyway, uh, so um, a couple more sentences and then I jump to part two of, of this uh, conversation. Uh, so uh, I was supposed to be in charge of connecting with people, collecting money, uh, and writing the menu, etc. Uh, we already had a friend of ours who was supposed to be the barrister, which is the person that runs the bar, the one that makes the coffee. But just before the shop opened, the guy decides to, to leave us and not to work with us anymore. So that became a problem uh, because I didn't have the skills, but I had people that could teach me. So one thing I learned is that uh, I learned uh, not to fear what I do not know. It means I just jump in and I learn as much as I can and somehow I think I probably would survive. And I have. And in a short stint of about uh, five to six years, right? I have become a very good uh, barrister. I understand coffee uh, decent, uh, decently well. And uh, people who come and drink my coffee appreciate uh, the effort that I put to make a good cup of coffee as opposed to just making coffee and selling it. Uh, so that's that. Let's jump to the coffee machine. Okay, I'm going to swap to the, the bar area. Oh, awesome. This is what I wanted. Okay, guys. So this is the coffee grinder. Can you guys see it? Yes, those who can see, do a thumbs up. No thumbs up. Okay. So that's the coffee grinder. This is an espresso machine. This is where we're going to do some work. Okay, so usually uh, my coffee comes in giant buckets of 8 kilos. But today, because I'm just uh, doing a demo for you guys, I'm using a small pack that's a gift from someone from Africa. So normally we will buy this at 200 or 250 grams, right? So this uh, coffee beans, let me show it to you. Can you guys see? Okay, so generally it is brown in color. But note that this coffee beans, right, uh, originally start out as, we call them cherries. They are actually uh, light yellow color. That's the original color. So what happened was in the 6th or 7th century, uh, this sheep herder 
had his goats in this place called Kappa Bonga in uh, Ethiopia. The sheep started munching on these uh, berries that are from the trees. And after having that, they started jumping up and now hyperactive. Then the, 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 the shepherd was thinking, what happened, right? So that's when coffee was discovered. So they discovered that by roasting uh, the coffee beans, uh, it, it uh, caramelizes the sugar in the coffee and gives it more flavors. Um, generally speaking, every country that produces coffee uh, should be high altitude, very high above sea level. And every single region, uh, the coffee has different profiles. Generally, there are two kinds of coffee that, that's uh, uh, noticeably drunk in the world. One is the Robusta, one is the Arabica. The one in my hand is the Arabica. Arabica is the uh, more expensive one. The other one, the Robusta, is called Robusta because it's robust, meaning it has less susceptible to uh, being attacked by, by insects and all that and having a problem with the coffee. That one is hardier, is cheaper, and the caffeine level is really high. The Arabica, on the other hand, uh, has got more complex notes. Uh, that's why third wave coffee places like myself uh, and other cafes, uh, we use this kind of coffee more than the other kind. The other kind is the one that you find in Nest Cafe, the one that your mommy and daddy will buy from the uh, NTC or cold storage. Yeah, the cheaper coffee. Not that it's not a good coffee, it's just the flavors are bolder and it's, uh, uh, the profiles are very simple, two, three notes. Whereas for the Arabica, you've got more complexity, more notes. Okay, beans into the hopper. So what I'm doing now is uh, I'm adjusting how long it takes uh, for the coffee to come out. Uh, I've already pre-adjusted the, the grinding machine on the fineness of the coffee beans that will be grinded. So uh, just think about it like sand. The finer the sand, the more compact it is, the coffee comes out slower. The bigger the sand or the pebbles, the water passes through very fast. So the coffee comes out very fast. Okay. So my size, I think, is going to be slightly finer. So, okay, let's start on that, yeah? While it's grinding, I have a weighing scale. Uh, good baristas always have at least two or three of this around. The reason is to weigh out the coffee that we're using, to weigh out the milk. Why? So that it's always consistent. That means if anybody comes to drink the coffee today, example, I'm using the coffee from Africa, um, um, Ethiopia, let's say, then the taste should be the same today as it was tomorrow or the day after. However, if I do not weigh my coffee, I give you more coffee today, less coffee tomorrow. Obviously, the one with less coffee, you're going to get less flavor. So that's not consistent. So it doesn't work that way. We have to be very consistent. That's why I'm weighing it out. So in this case, um, most coffee joints internationally, we start out with 17 grams of coffee and we move up to 18, 19 grams, sometimes even 20 grams. So for today, I'm gonna to go with 17 grams. What I have here is this thing called a Porter filter. If you look carefully, I remove this. You see the minute holes? Yeah, it's like a filter. So the coffee grains are going to go in this. I'm going to level it. I'm going to put pressure on it. So we call it tamping. The coffee goes in. I have this thing called a leveler which basically, can you see the, tri, the three sides to it? It basically levels out the coffee. But before that, I will use my own hands to do it first, to balance out the coffee, to keep it as even as possible. So when the water punches through, uh, it's the coffee flavors are extracted fully rather than one-sided opposed to the other. 
this is the damper. I will apply pressure with my, my right, I'm a right hander with my right shoulder and my right body weight to keep the, the coffee compact and tight. Okay, I'm going to start extracting the coffee. Another weighing scale to weigh out how much coffee I need. So if I put in 17 grams, I should be extracting 17 grams. I'll probably start at 15. You will keep dripping until about 17. Okay, I hope you can see this somehow. Yes, you can. So the white, the um, mocha-ish colored brown that you're looking at is called the crema. Crema means uh, cream. Cream means fat. So basically, we're extracting the oils from the coffee so that it has the flavor there. Uh, I'm going to do a latte. So we're going to use milk. So the milk itself has to be weighed as well, yeah? The next tool I'm using is called the wand. Can you see the steam coming out? Okay, so basically the wand injects steam into the milk to heat it up uh, evenly. There is a skill, it takes a while to learn it. But if, uh, so basically I want to inject the right amount of steam into the milk to have the right temperature, the right amount of micro foams, the little bubbles in there. So when someone, when you hear someone say, I want a cappuccino. So cappuccino basically means a lot of foam. Uh, Italians like that. Uh, uh, Italians like to drink that. Filipinos like to drink that. Uh, the latte is less foam, so slightly less heat. Moderate uh, heat, easy to drink. The next one, uh, the milk-based uh, coffee is called the flat white. So it's flat, meaning very little microfoam. Me that uh, equates to very slow, sorry, very fast uh, injection of steam, and that's it, release. After I, I after I put the foam into the milk, I'm going to do some latte art. I don't know if you can see the, the process, but my hands are moving intensely to force the milk into the coffee to integrate it. That's how we create one flavor. If I don't do it well or I don't have the practice, the coffee will taste watery and not fully uh, blended together. All right, let's start. So I'm actually using my left palm. You can see I'm a right-handed palm. My left palm was the one that's controlling, holding the cup to feel the temperature. My right hand was the one that was adjusting the wand so that I can angle the wand to control the amount of steam going in. I Can you see? Yes, you can see there's a bit. It's silky, not too for me. Okay, now we do the artwork. I don't think you can see this, but I'll show you the end point. Maybe, can you see? Oh, yes, you can. Okay, it's not very pretty today, but you can see I created something that looks like a flower. Right. So every morning we got to do this process. This whole process is called cupping. Cupping means we are taking flavors from the coffee to extracting coffee to taste to see whether it's the flavor that we want to serve today. So a good coffee joint should not serve you coffee that's bitter all throughout the whole drink or sour. So what we are aiming for is a caramelization um, uh, uh, tone. That means when I punch the water through the water filter into the coffee grains, uh, I only want the water to stay there for the right amount of time to take all the sweet notes and then it comes out and I stop, I cut it. But if I put the water inside for too long and it, it, it stays in there for too long and it drags uh, too, uh, for too long, then I'm going to get a lot of bitter notes. It's overcooking, right? For another word. But if the water goes in real fast and comes out real fast, it did not get all the flavors. The water just punched through the coffee grains Grab whatever little stuff and it came out, that coffee will be sour. 
So that is not good coffee. Okay, now I'm going to taste. I'm going to tell you what I taste. It may not be a good cup because I never played this coffee before. Uh, it's not my typical coffee. It's a gift from someone in Africa. So I'll put in my palate. I let it rest on my lower palate. First sip, second sip, I'm going to go for it again. I'm going to let, let, let it go all the way back to my back palate to see what are the sweet or the whatever notes that this coffee is going to tell me. And I will describe to you what I'm tasting. So um, this packaging uh, has a problem uh, in that it does not state which part of Africa it's from. So I have no way of picturing where what flavors is coming from, which region. Whereas when it comes to Central American coffee, I know uh, which part of, of uh, Central America, what kind of flavors I'm getting. But that said, what I just drank is a very good cup. When it went into my mouth, the first thing that I had was sweetness. And then as you went to my lower and back palates, right, I begin to get more and more sweet notes. This one is very smooth, very balanced. That means that I have managed to control the acidity level to keep it low so that it's not bitter. And um, very mocha-ish. Very mocha. Mocha basically is chocolate uh, with coffee and milk. So I'm getting a very chocolatey note, very balanced. So, well, for a coffee that's got no region on it, except for the general Africa, it's a very good coffee. Then the next part is very important, and that's got to do with life. We will start with something, you got to finish it, right? After I finish extracting the coffee, I need to clean my machine. I need to get rid of the grains. So we have this thing here. Mine is a mini one. It's called a knock box. I'm going to knock the coffee grains into this. Uh, all coffee places should have two cloths that they use. One is a darker cloth, in this case, black and a grayish cloth, okay? The grayish cloth is to clean the magical one, the one, so that there's no coffee, there's no milk, there's no chocolate on it, in that it will not transfer to the next cup. So I'm not gonna add more flavors. If I serve you this cup, it's this cup. Now, the black one is good, it's for cleaning my potter filter, so I do not have old. Can you see the dark greens there? Yes, you can. I'm not gonna have old greens in here and I put new ones because I should be giving you a fresh cup with new flavors. If I don't clean up, I'm going to block the filter. I'm going to add uh, uh, stale coffee notes to your coffee. Now, that's a bad barrister. So that's what the, the darker cloth is for. So generally, we just use a finger and we just uh, clear it through. If it's, uh, if it's still uh, dirty, in this case, you can see it's fairly clean. I'll just get some water uh, from the wand and then I just clean it up. Um, this part here, I can't show you with the camera. Actually, I can, I can show you. Give me a short second. These two places that the powder filter goes to is called the shower head. Why is it called a shower head? because it really, really looks like a shower head. Because like the shower that you have in your, in your own house, your bathroom, right? The water comes out. So this is called a shower screen. So this is the one where, can you see there are dark grains on it? Yeah, because I just make coffee. So every time I finish uh, making one shot of coffee, I need to flush it out with water. Mind you, my hand doesn't seem to be hurting, but it's really hot. Just that I've been baking bread for a long time, so I can take the heat. So we release water. And then with the same black cloth, we clean it up. We do a quick check. Yeah, everything is gone. I don't think you can see the water, but there are greens in there. So that's that. Uh, okay, let's jump uh, back to the third session. A bit more sharing and a bit of Q&A. All right, give me a second. 
Oh, that was very um technical. technical <laughs> yeah, uh, technical. Yeah, but it's very it was very interesting. I think we got a very good intro about coffee and like you explain about um the machine how it works and also um yeah about the coffee that there's a difference between I always wondered uh, the arabica and the robusta or so um and also I was I think I I put on the co on the comments okay I also I will learn to taste my coffee carefully next time to taste you know, to taste all the different notes because when you buy coffee there's always the uh, you know they have a description like go Nespresso, they'll say, oh, sweet notes and all that. So I wonder what is it? So now at least, okay, so I saw you tasting the coffee with, you know, you go use your all your palate. So that was, yeah, yeah that was very informative. So now I'll, I'll let the participants ask questions. You can unmute yourself or you can type your question on the chat. Can I add to what you just said about oh, tasting sure, coffee? Sure. Yeah, just to add on that part. So the first sip that you take is always a strong note. So sometimes it will come off as bitter, but right. it's only upon, and, and mind you, you are taking the top part first, which is a lot, of, a lot of foam. It's only upon the second sip, as you drink and let it go to the back palate, right? That's when you get all the finer details. Then as you continue your conversation with your friends and you keep drinking, right? Then the full flavors will go to your whole mouth. And when that happens, the best uh, 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 um, measure of how good the coffee is, is when you leave the cafe. When you leave the cafe or on the way to your car, to your bus, to MRT to go home, and then your mouth, if you hey, I can still taste the sweetness. Oh, wow, I'm very bitter now. Eh. Then you know whether that was a good coffee or not. Okay, I saw one question already. How long have I been making coffee? Something like that. Uh, okay, a lot of questions. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, where did I learn to make coffee and how long? Yeah, I've been doing this for six years. Uh, I learned it from this gentleman called uh, Glenn from Prodigal Roasters. He's a friend of a friend. Uh, a roaster is a person that takes these yellow cherries, uh, roasts the coffee evenly so that it's all even colours. And then that brings out the flavours. And uh, he's the one that taught me how to make. But most of the making of the coffee actually is your tongue. The more you taste, the, the better you are, the more educated you are. Uh, if you don't taste your coffee and you just make and serve every single day uh, because it's always the same, num uh, same amount of weight and all that, you will not taste your coffee, you don't learn. And I can attest that when I make coffee for the first month, the sixth month, and the third year, all three cups taste very different. So the longer I, uh, my, my time in doing coffee, right, the better my coffee tastes. And I had this very fortunate uh, instance where I made a flat white for my friend's husband. He came in, uh, then uh, I made the flat white for him. He drank the coffee and he commented to the wife. And the wife asked me, hey, what did you put in your coffee? Uh? My husband said, uh, the minute he drank the coffee right, he felt so refreshed in his soul. Now, that is making coffee well and having the right attitude to want to do it well. If I had a bad attitude that day and I made the coffee, just uh, Chin Chai made the coffee and sent it out right. Uh, I believe in the Japanese philosophy where your heart comes out in the things that you do. So it's like when if my heart is good, I talk to you, I'm always a friendly guy. If my heart's got an attitude, I'll always be, I used to, I'll be very tough with you. So in the same way, when my hands are moving and making bread or making coffee, right, my heart, my passion goes into that and you can taste it. Yeah, okay, next question. Uh, you can learn making coffee online, uh, but I would say that Gaining the knowledge about coffee and making it is one thing, but you actually need to practice. Uh, not practice for 10 years, uh, because you can have bad practice and you always be bad. But practice well, practice good, have feedback, have people drink your coffee and give you their, their, their point of view. And if they say the coffee is not nice, don't take it personally. It's just that you have not improved your technique yet. That's all. So uh, with that, I want to jump in with uh, something special. If any of you guys uh, in this program want to pop by here for breakfast or lunch, right? And I'm free. I welcome you to come into the counter and see me make coffee. And I'll let you try to do some steaming of the one. Yeah. <laughs> just for the fun of you guys. Okay. Uh, what's the easiest way to make uh, what's the easiest coffee to make? Black coffee. Because all you need is coffee grains, a cup of hot water, you press, stop, that's it, send it out. In that sense, it's easy to make. But I must say that the technique of using your arm and your strength to damp your coffee uh, into the uh, potter filter to compress it, that uh, takes time to, to have the right level of strength for a good extraction of coffee. Meaning when I train people, I train people to make coffee before. The first few cups they make always taste bad because they have not figured out how much pressure 
how much strength to put into the to compress the, the coffee grains. Yeah, so it takes time. But that is the easiest coffee. Okay. Uh worst coffee fails. Worst coffee. I don't understand the question. I think maybe it means uh have I made a bad coffee before? Um yes, I have. Generally, my rule is if I make a bad coffee, I throw it away. I never serve anyone because uh, I put myself in uh, the uh, myself in someone else's shoe. If I go somewhere and I pay money for something and it tastes bad, I don't want to go back there again. So that person deserves the best. So I'll throw it away and I'll remake it again. Okay. Is making coffee hard? It's not. It's uh, deciding to set your mind and your heart to want to make it and stick through it no matter what. That's the, the, the hard part, being focused. Have you burned your hand before? A lot of times I've burned my hands. I've cut my hands. Every time it's a Saturday, Sunday, I injure myself. I always get cuts because um, we are moving at such a fast pace. You've got like maybe 12 cups coming in within a span of three minutes. So you've got to move really fast to get all the coffee out. So because of the speed in which our hands are moving, sometimes we just brush against parts of the machine that cut our hands. But really, it's just, to me, it's minor. It's the person drinking the coffee coming back and say, Oi, your coffee are really good. Eh? That's what I, I, I'm, it makes me happy. Okay. Uh, the hardest part, what was the, from Elisha, right? What was the hardest part to learn the making coffee for you? Um, the hardest part, one of the hardest part actually is the tasting. Because sometimes you can have an estimate of uh, when the coffee was roasted. So you know how fine you want the grains. Uh, and there's this part here I didn't explain earlier. It's called pre-infusion. Bear with me, I'll explain that to you. Pre-infusion uh, means uh, infusing of water into the coffee grains before the coffee is extracted. That part there is important because when the water goes into the, the potter filter, right, it is actually balancing out the coffee, wetting it so that it stays tight together. Then the water, then after it, um, the, the pressure is punched in through the, the water, hot water, and it comes out. Um, sometimes we do that and we taste the coffee, not nice. We adjust the size, not nice. We adjust the size, not nice. You can drink five cups and you don't even drink full five cups. You just take two sips each, 10 sips of that. Uh, immediately you get a headache. That's the hardest part. And then you get a headache and then you get frustrated. It's like, oh man, the coffee tastes so bad. What am I going to do next? Then you got to figure out, okay, let's just go to the, the most acceptable point and then take a two hour break, drink lots of water. Then we come back and try again. Now that's the hardest part because I don't like to serve bad things to people or things that I think is not the best and optimal. Okay. What, uh, uh, um, do you enjoy making coffee? Yes, I do, obviously. Do you own your coffee shop? Yes. Uh, this place, I'll show you the signboard later. The Low Shack at Springleaf Nature Park. Um, what do you think the difference between an espresso and a barista make coffee? Uh, I don't have much comments on this one. Um, let's put it this way. Uh, when you buy gardenia bread and you buy bread from a bakery that's made by a baker as opposed to gardenia factory making the bread, which one do you prefer to eat? I go to the baker. So Nespresso is smart. They are not wrong. They are designed to create machines for offices or homes where you don't have the big setup for water pumps and all that to do all these things. So they're just going to press one button, you come back and then you get your drink. The beautiful thing about Nespresso is they are very good at R&D. So you can have 14 different flavors at one time. You can choose all the capsules that you want. That, that is the good part about it. Um, but Barrister Make Coffee uh, is more work, but it's more enjoyable. You get to taste like, oh man, today the coffee are uh, too watery. Never mind, I try again later in the afternoon another cup. And then you actually get to hit yourself against yourself to do a better cup. I think that's more fun than, than Nespresso coffee. But that's it. If I'm stuck in a hotel, there's no machine at Nespresso, drink Nespresso lah. Okay. Um, when you taste the coffee, oh, wait, wait, wait. when you taste the coffee and you get the sweet, bitter notes, does it only apply to hot coffee? No, not necessarily. Um... There is another kind of coffee. I hope I'm not boring you guys. It's called cold brew. Example, there are many kinds of coffee. Uh, cold brew essentially means uh, very roughly grounded coffee grains. What I was doing earlier was fine. Now I'm going for a coarser one. Putting it in a container of uh, normal room temperature water or cold water and then leaving it in the fridge to age whereby the water extracts the flavor from the coffee. So there's no pressure. 
Whereas the hot poppy is the one where, where the machine pumps the hot water in and extracts the pressure through uh, that short span of time. So um, yes, your coffee can have sweet notes, uh, bitter sweet notes together, there are floral notes and even uh, 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 fruity notes, uh, which is typical of something like a Chiang Rai coffee. Chiang Rai coffee from Thailand. Thailand has been producing coffee for more than 70 over years. High altitude, good place. They got good coffee there. I love that coffee. Uh, next question says Lone Shark. I don't understand. Uh. I look at Lone Shark. Uh. <laughs> Brian to me. Am I a Lone Shark? Uh, no, la, no Lone Shark. I don't have that much money to lend you. I can teach you skills. <laughs> okay. Okay, this is a good question from, I can't pronounce, I think it's uh, Yael Quack, is it? Or Yael Quack, okay. If you hadn't become a barrister, what career do you think you would be doing instead? Uh, I mean, in the kitchen, cooking have to do with food. I, I enjoy cooking. I enjoy executing the moves and the precise timing to have the right uh, food product out to people. If not, then uh, I'll probably go in an orphanage. I love working with people. Uh, I love going to the forested areas, which I've been through before in Chiang, Chiang Mai and, and, and some other places. So that's where uh, I enjoy uh, myself. Yeah. How has your work in the crime investigation helped you with what you are doing now? <laughs> well, very chim the question, uh, Grace. Um, systematic. Uh, criminal investigation I taught me to be very systematic. It's the same approach with coffee. It's very systematic. You need to know how old your coffee is. You need to know what grind size you want. You need to know uh, uh, how much pre-infusion you want to put, whether it's two seconds of water sitting in there or 10 seconds of water sitting in there. That's the pre-infusion part. And then when you do the extraction, you need to know, okay, uh, this coffee is from this region. The flavor note should be this kind of flavor notes. And then when you take it, it's not right. You got to go back again. Same with investigation. You can't solve the case. That means you missed something. You got to go back to the very beginning, relook all your notes, look for new leads, look for new witnesses to get that, that one statement or that one observation by someone that pointed to this crime being committed. Very similar. Um, okay. Have you ever hated making coffee? Uh, no, I haven't. But let me tell you something that not I don't tell many people. Actually, I cannot drink coffee. I get headaches when I drink coffee very fast. So uh, I generally cannot take too much coffee. Uh, but that never stopped me from being a good barrister. Like I said, I have no fear. I jump in. I need to fill in the gap. There's no barrister. I learn to be the barrister. And as I do it, and as people come and say, hey, your coffee is this, this taste is this good, or it's not hitting a mark today. And as I drink more, I begin to realize that it's like wine. Every time I drink, I'm catching a different note. Uh, like two weeks ago, I had coffee from Vietnam and Ethiopia, and it tasted like durian. It really tasted like durian. It's like, what? It's durian. I let, let my barrister beside me, my co-barrister drink, say, hey, yeah, but told uh, durian. Uh. I brought to one of my regular customers, say, hey, cha, you taste. Hey, really are uh, durian. So, so, so it's a discovery. So that, that, that doing a coffee and discovering what other profile, profiles will come out, I think that that's part of the joy of uh, the coffee, uh, coffee making. Uh, one part that's um, very sien about, uh, that I don't like doing, of course, but I have to do is the cleaning up. Because what I showed you was one cup of coffee. Imagine I've been making coffee for five hours non-stop, right? Which is typical Saturday, Sunday morning. After that five hours, the counter, uh, lack of a better word, I really like war zone. Uh, coffee grains everywhere, milk on the floor. The, the cloth that I used to wipe the milk stinks. You know, like cheese that's left on the table for too long, that kind of smell. Uh. So it's the cleanup. After the cleanup, then you got to sweep the floor. Eh? You got to mop the floor. You got to clean the machine and all that. So yeah, those, those, those parts are some of the tough parts. Okay, which unnecessary? The, does customers come to your coffee shop? Uh, I hope so. If they don't come to my coffee shop, I won't be here anymore. And I got no money. Le. Okay. How has your time in YWAM impacted what you are doing? Um, to serve with all of my heart. Long. So uh, I serve uh, with an attitude as though uh, I am making coffee for Jesus. Every cup I make is for Jesus. So if the coffee is wrong, the weight is wrong, I generally will just throw it, I redo again. Yeah. Do you have a Beverly to everyone? Beverly, do you want to be a part-time waiter here? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, but we don't call them waiters, we call them servers. 
We don't serve the food to people like most restaurants because I don't want to charge service charge and GST. We have our servers call the customers to collect and the servers just need to clean up the table, do a bit of washing uh, and welcome people into the shop. That's all. Okay. Uh, Brie Ann to me, what's your favorite coffee brand to make? Coffee brand. There is no coffee brand. There is a coffee region from which country? So uh, one of the ones that I like is from Chiang Rai. Chiang Rai coffee has got very nice fruity notes. Uh, I like Chiang Rai. I like Ethiopian. Uh, gosh, I can't remember the name now. Um, oh, I forgot. Anyway, there's a, one of the world's best coffee is from Ethiopia, where it's one of the highest uh, sea level area. The coffee there is gorgeous. When I remember, I'll just let you guys know. I love coffee from those two regions. What are the challenges to setting up your cafe? Uh, uh, setting up cafe is in Singapore is one of the hardest jobs in the world. Uh, because you have a lot of variables, that means there are a lot of things that you need to look into and know how to deal with it. Uh, like now I have a problem. At the end of the month, I got two of my staff leaving. One kitchen uh, hand and one front of the house. Uh, two of them are leaving. So finding the manpower is difficult, but finding the right manpower is more difficult. Right manpower means I'm looking for someone, whether it's part-time or full-time, to come and want to do a good job and want to learn. Uh, that's the hard part. Because not everybody in the food industry wants to learn. Many of them, example, if I'm a Malaysian, I come to Singapore, uh, my one ring, my, my, if I come here to work, I earn 3.3 times more than what I earn in Malaysia. So when I come here to work, it's for the money. So not every one of them is gifted in the crowd. They just do it for the sake of doing. So that's uh, one of the challenges. Um, I have many miraculous stories to talk about my shop. This is my second shop, uh, second location. First location was at Queen Street. Uh, I've seen miracles happen where, where I, when I started a business, I had almost no money. And I felt prompted in my heart to ask specifically 12 people to lend me money to open up the shop. Not all 12 said yes, about seven of them said yes. So they were the ones that helped me with the with, uh, uh, finance to start the shop. But the hardest challenge right, is when you are a no brand, you are not Starbucks, you are nobody, and you start a brand and you're not a famous chef, not a famous barrister, why should any customer come to your shop? They should go to the next shop with long, long queue. Uh, so that's the hardest part. So we bear with so much pain and heartache for three years. We cry for three years. Nobody sees. Where sometimes the days, the sales for that day, right, is like $50. Not profit, our uh, sales. Uh. So after you minus out the cost of goods, uh, the profit that day was $30. You got five staff in the shop. $30 divided by five, everybody gets $6 for that day. <laughs> yeah, that, that is one tough part. Another tough part is when people who are not in the F&B business, uh, sometimes go on Google review or tell their friend, wow, oh, this place, uh, the coffee no good, uh, the food no good, uh, ta, 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 and they give their point of view. But when you read their things like, hey, you, you're not in the industry, you don't understand. Like recently I had this girl who said, she waited 30 minutes for her food. Then I thought to myself, I go to Chongbang Market, I buy Mipo, uh, the wait time uh, is 20 to 40 minutes. Uh, I get there to complain to uncle, your Mipo takes so long. Uh. Cannot, uh, uncle need the time to make the noodle for you, nice. If the uncle make it chin chai, anyhow, three minutes pass to you, you want to eat? I don't want to eat long. So the person don't understand. The person say, oh, all I ordered was an avocado toasty. We just avocado and sourdough bread. What takes so long? To me, it's like, hey, dude, this one uh, is not your ticket. It's the most important ticket. It's what ticket is in front of yours. So it goes by sequence. So whether yours is a complex one or an easy one, oh, have to wait. The first five tickets need to go first, then it's your ticket. So they don't understand. So when they write things like this, and some of them can be influencers, right? They write about you something that's... um. Uh, one-sided without full understanding, right? They don't understand the damage they do to companies. So when I started, I was very offended sometimes by Google review. After what I said, I don't care, don't reply. I just pray, I say, God, you better talk to them yourself. I don't care. So I just do the good things I do. Then the customers, when you look at my reviews, my reviews are fairly good, I think. You, as a person with Singaporean that's very cognitively smart, right? You look at the reviews. If 98% or 95% of the people give you um, uh, five stars, right? And only maybe 2%, 3% give one star, two star, then you can decide what is the true plot. Yeah, so that's one of the things. So I learned to not take uh, offense by what people say about my shop or about my me. It's an ongoing learning. Okay. What do you think of copying from Starbucks, especially the ones with the weird names? Well, I don't know what's a weird name. Eh. Uh, Yael, you want to tell me what's a weird name? <laughs> Oh, you mean like their, their, their fabrication, uh, like they call it uh, super macchiato or something like that. That's what you mean, is it? 
Okay, so uh okay, so so I don't mean to say bad things about Starbucks, but Starbucks is a very good company, it's a very smart company. They know that all human beings love sugar. So actually, I tell you the truth, uh, Starbucks don't sell you coffee, they sell you sugar. Sugar in the guise of coffee. That's why their coffee will never be good. But their coffee will always be sweet and addictive. Yes. But when you come to a specialty place like ours, uh, one man coffee and all the other other guys, right? Uh, common man roasters and all that, right? You can drink the coffee. You actually don't need sugar one. As you drink the coffee, you actually get a lot of notes. And that requires more skill. Nah, it's got nothing to do with artwork. Artwork is important, but that one is so hila, blah, blah, blah. It's the integration of the coffee that's important, the milk and the coffee. Yeah. Okay. Beverly asks, how many types of coffee do you know how to make? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> A lot, a lot, a lot. A lot because I am a creator. I create a lot of coffee. So I have this one called the Sleeping Dragon. Only one in Singapore. So Sleeping Dragon essentially is a coffee that's extracted like an espresso. That means hot water into the, 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 the water filter. The coffee comes out 18 grams. And then I will extract maybe five portions of that. I put it in the fridge. Tomorrow, I extract another five. I put it in the fridge combined with the first day's one. And then the third day, I do the same thing. The fourth day, the fifth day, until I have so much flavors in that coffee, right? It's special. Then with that, um, I serve it as an iced latte with milk. And I had this thing called jaggery. Jaggery is dark Indian sugar. It's a byproduct of sugar cane. So jaggery is sweet, but it is meant not to be a sweet drink, but meant to uh, balance out the acidity of the coffee because you've got so much coffee in there. So the Sleeping Dragon is very smooth. It's like drinking uh, a nice Japanese iced latte in Tokyo. Yeah, that, that one is a good one, the Sleeping Dragon. Uh, so I got a lot, I created a lot of coffee. Uh, I even do cold brew. Uh, my cold brew, if you all come tomorrow or the day, uh, you come on Wednesday when I'm around, uh, you get one cup free. <laughs> I only got one cup left from uh, Papua New Guinea. Okay. Okay, hey, Wednesday. Uh -huh. yeah. I must try your Sleeping Dragon coffee. <laughs> okay. So the pumpkin spice actually is not a bad idea. I think that adding spices to coffee is good. I got one coffee called the East End Dragon. I have spices in that. And it's not chili spice, huh? Uh, even though I've done a chili spice coffee before, I put uh, kimchi powder inside. Uh, <laughs> pumpkin uh, has got sweet uh, buttery notes. The spice, if it's a nutmeg and a cinnamon, I, I'm, I don't know what their recipe is. I'm just throwing it out, right? With coffee that's dark and bitter, with milk that's uh, balanced and ice, pumpkin spice coffee will work. If it's an ice latte, can work. Okay, next. Fruitcake cappuccino. Uh. Hey, Elisha, you made for me. <laughs> I don't know how to make. Fruitcake very... Uh, too grainy, ah. Uh. Unless I make a, a frappe, frappe, yeah, uh, frappe can, uh, But I don't do frappe here, lah. Uh. I, I, I like to keep it a bit more simple. But I can put the flavors of the fruit cake spices into a drink. Yes, I can. <laughs> Why is it called Sleeping Dragon? Very good. You know, lot of the rings, ah. Uh. <laughs> uh, smoke, smoke the dragon. Sleeping Dragon because when you drink it, after that you wake up. The dragon inside of you wake up. Yeah, it's just uh, you know, wake up the dragon, ah. Uh. Wake the dragon. Yeah, Sleeping Dragon. I think we need it, the moms especially. Oh yeah, sleeping in the fridge, sleeping in the fridge. <laughs> yes, it sits in the fridge. Because if I leave it out, you will still. I keep it in the fridge uh, to protect it. Yeah, let me show you the bottle. Wow. Can you see all these dark patches? This is unfiltered. That means whatever I make with the coffee, I throw it in here. And then uh, I want the grains to be in there because normally potter filter is a filter, right? It filters out this, I don't. I keep it in there because I want the flavors from all these grains right, to stay in the coffee. And you can see it's very thick. You can even see some, I uh, don't know how clear. Uh, you see all these fragments here? You see that 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 that, that thing there? Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's crystallized, crystallized uh, coffee grains that bound together. Uh, this one very short. Okay, I'm, uh, Don, I'll ask uh, the last few questions. So I'll, okay. okay, I'll tap it. Do you take a barista course or were you self-taught then? I was taught by Glenn. I'll answer the full question. Oh, okay. I was taught by Glenn from Prodigal Roasters. He didn't teach me every day. La. He came uh -huh. in, taught me like 45 minutes today. Then tomorrow, he come and out 45 minutes. Then the rest is pure practice. Like all the artwork that you watch on Instagram, all those barristers doing the artwork, that is many, many hours of practice before they can have their wrists very loose. They can control very well. Yeah, and that's just part two. Part one is the foaming of the milk. You can foam the milk wrongly. I like, just not mind the foam was beautiful, but because I was doing it for the camera, all that I, I I didn't do that great a job. Or else it would be a looser, uh, uh less uh less less bound uh bound together coffee. Okay. Do you enjoy did your children learn to make coffee and bake from you and your wife? My daughter is like my wife. Naturally, she loves 
to bake. And I taught my daughter to be a barrister at nine years old. So she hasn't done it for a few years, but I've trained her since she was nine, ten years old. She works in the shop uh, on weekends and all that. Yeah. Uh, and if that person has the heart to teach you a skill, just go and learn. Because that's what it was like in the 1800s, in the 1700s. You want a skill, you go and work with a cobbler. You want to be a carpenter, you work with a carpenter. All you get is food and lodging. No money, man, zero. But you learn the skill. So it's a forward-looking thing. So after you learn the skill, you go anywhere, you can use it. But if you come to my shop and ask for us to be interviewed to be a barrister, I can train you. Then the good thing is, once you, your parents decide to send you to Australia to study, right? You can work part-time as a barrister and you can say, oh, I worked at this coffee place for X number of years part-time. Experience, nobody can take away. Uh, I know my friend's son, whose uh, wife is whose mother is uh, South African, but uh, white uh, South African. So the mother told him to make pizza. So he was in New York, uh, one of the top dance schools in New York. Then he went to work part-time in the, pizza, in, 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 the, in the bakery place and they were losing money. Then he told the guy, hey, let's make pizza. You know make pizza? Yes, you know make pizza. Within a short span of a month, right, the company started making money because this young man had no fear to go and try. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just go into the industry. Uh, don't uh, be very focused. Don't be like a lot of young students that go to schools, uh, culinary schools, and think that when I come out, I want, uh, example, $4,000, and I want to be Byungshan within a year. Be very famous. Uh, I will say to you, I know Byungshan is a personal friend of mine. Uh. One Byungshan, uh, got another 5,000 people in the kitchen. Uh, nobody knows about, nobody will ever see on TV. Uh. Why do they keep staying in the industry? Because they love to do what they do. They see that and go, I just want to do a good product out. If I get recognized for it, great. If I get a great pay, great. Is the kitchen hot? Of course the kitchen is hot. Will I burn my hand? Yes, you burn your hand. Does my feet hurt? Yes. Do I burn weekends? Yes. Will I lose my holidays? Yes. Uh, you do it. Lah. You do it because you love it, because you want to learn. You don't care about all these small things. If you care about all these small things, right, please go and go and uh, <laughs> go and do TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna be a TikTok there and then a million dollars there. You you can't do it here. Okay, have no fear. Enjoy the journey. You will discover about yourself things and, and as you explore. And and I want to say one thing. Uh, no one's that's not everybody's destined. They are born. They know they want to be a doctor. All their life they'll be a doctor. There are many of us that have so many gifts, so many talents. It just comes out at different seasons of your life. You're just going to enjoy it and just see what comes out. And then at the end of the day, maybe when you're fifty or sixty years old, then you realize that all your gifts come in at one point where you need to do something very important for your family, for the planet, for the country. Uh, I also added two more things. I, I added the word seek counsel. Seek counsel, ask people, hey, ask somebody who's in the, let's say you want to be a chef, seek somebody that's in the F&B business that's cooking. Hey, what can I learn? What are the things I need to look out for? Go and speak. When you speak to them, they'll give you the truth, right? And the last one is uh, foundation and values. Uh, you must have strong foundation, you must have values. Because if you, if you don't find those values and those foundations, right, it's easy to get distracted. Why I say that? Because a lot of people in the F&B business, right, they work very hard to, through the night until 1, 2 a.m., right? They can't sleep. So when they can't sleep and their values are not strong, right, they turn to drugs, they turn to alcohol just to get themselves to sleep. You know what I mean? So those things don't need money. They don't help you. So if you know, uh, you speak to people, get good foundation, have values that are important to you. Like for me, my family is important. I won't sacrifice my family for anything. So that's what I will stick to all the time. Yeah, I'd rather not work today and be with my son than to work today. Ah, to me, that, that is value. So these, these four things are important. Thank you.